All right. I like it. I like it. You guys look wonderful out there. Happy Father's Day to all the fellas out there. You can always tell the dads because they always have on a brand new shirt. <laughs> They're going to wear these shirts for the next six months because that's when Christmas hits and we get the next new shirt. Man, this is it, guys. This is, this is the last one for me, so we're going we're gonna to make it count. All right, we're going to make it count. Um, you guys see today, we're thinking biblically about abortion. And so I just want to start off by saying that we're family, all right? And so I want us to leave as family. Um, I kind of look at it like we've been in the trenches together for the past two years, and so I think we've all earned the right to call one another brothers and sisters, or I can call you guys that. Um, so this is it. I want to just open us up in prayer, and then we're going to jump right into this thing. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for who you are, God, and for how you've created each one of us to be so different than the one sitting next to us, Lord. God, we are just an example of your your workmanship. So, Father, today as we dive into some, some deep subjects, Lord, I just ask right now that you would soften our hearts and open our ears. Holy Spirit, rest upon this place. We ask these things in your name. Amen. I didn't realize how, how passionate I was about this subject until um, I started, you know, researching it, and then I had to preach it once already. Um, but one thing I did want to say is that um, just for the parents out there, if you have not spoken to your kids about some of these things that we've been talking about during this series, I just want to strongly encourage you, especially when it comes to abortion, um, to have these conversations with your kids. Uh, I can promise you, because I've got three and they're all in the public school system, I can promise you that if you don't talk to your kids about it, then the schools will. And they're going to give them a very different viewpoint than they're going to get at church. Um, Also, because there's kids here, I just want to let you guys know that it is abortion that we're talking about today. I'm going to try to keep it as PG-13-ish as I possibly can, but, um, you know, I'll do my best. I see the babies in here, and I'm going to try to respect that. (laughs) All right, so also I just want to say that I've had help with this, with this message. Um, PJ, thank you for your, for your words that you uh, helped impart in this, and I've had some help from other guys that have helped me just with information. So this is me just compiling things, and this is all God. So listen, we're going to jump right in. I want to give you guys just some stats on abortion. All right, so there were 629,898 abortions in 2019. All right, all my numbers are going to come from 2019, all right? 14% of those abortions were performed on married women. And, and, and I got to be honest, man, that was really troubling to me because I, I'm not as moved by the 86% of unmarried women, but you would think that married women, you know, that you wanna, you'd want to keep it. 57% of abortions are performed on women in their 20s. And women living with a partner to whom they are not married account for 25% of abortions. And that's an interesting one to me, too, because right now we live in a culture that tells us that marriage is just a piece of paper. We can live together. We can try it before we buy it. But what's happening is that while this woman may want to live with you, because of your lack of commitment, fellas, she doesn't see herself wanting to raise a family with you yet. Women with one or two prior abortions accounted for 34% of these. So this is not just a one-time thing where, oh, this just happened and and, and I got to do it. 34% would be known as repeat offenders. Now, let's look at some of the reasons as to why this might be happening. All right, so 25% of these are saying that I'm just not ready for a child. And 23% are saying that I can't afford a baby. And for anybody in here with kids, you understand, they're expensive. 19% said that they're done having children. 8% said that they don't want to be a single mother. 7% said that they're not mature enough to raise a child. 4% said that it would interfere with their career or education. Another 4% said that it was the health of the mother And that's physical, mental, emotional, or even financial. So don't get it twisted on the health of the mother. All right, and then 1%, less than 1% are saying 
a victim of rape or incest. And let me, let me clarify this by saying that even less than 1% is too much. But it's not the whole thing. And what we often see is that when the media gets a hold of these, when the agenda gets a hold of these, we take this less than 1% and we turn it into 98%. That this is the only thing that's happening, and it's not. And so we need to be a little wiser when we're looking at our numbers to find out what's actually happening. We got to do our homework. Today, as I break down this message, we're going to kind of break it into three parts. We're going to look at it from a worldly perspective. All right, and then we're going to look at it from a biblical perspective, and then we're going to talk about how we as the church can respond. I want to start off now by reading an article. It's called, So What If Abortion Ends Life? Written by a woman. And this is about 10 years old now. She wrote this back in 2013. So you guys just kind of bear with me. Of all the diabolically clever moves the anti-choice lobby has ever pulled, truly one of the greatest has been its consistent co-opting of the word life. Life. Who wants to argue with that? Who wants to be on the side of not life? That's why the language of those terms who support, of those who support abortion has for so long been carefully couched in other terms. While opponents of abortion eagerly describe themselves as pro-life, the rest of us have had to scramble around with not nearly as big ticket words like choice and reproductive freedom. See, the life conversation is often too thorny to even broach. Yet I know that throughout my own pregnancies, I never wavered for a moment in the belief that I was carrying a human life inside of me. I believe that's what a fetus is, a human life. And that doesn't make me one iota less solidly pro choice. This is how she opens up the article. So what I kind of want to break down is that I need you guys to understand that when we as a church, when we pick a side, because sometimes the world has some great slogans, my body, my choice, sounds great. And when we jump on that side, I want you guys to understand that we're living in a time where we don't get to straddle the fence anymore. You're either hot or you're cold. Lukewarm doesn't exist. And I need you to know that even when we're funding this other side and saying, I do believe in my body, my choice, I want you to understand everything that you're buying into. It's not an a la carte. We don't get to pick and choose what parts you want to believe. Even if you just say, I only support my body, my choice, listen, keep listening, because I'm going to tell you what, what this is what the world is saying. Now, here's the complicated reality in which we live. All life is not equal. That's a difficult thing for liberals like me to talk about, lest we wind up looking like death panel loving, kill your grandma and your precious baby stormtroopers. Yet a fetus can be a human life without having the same rights as the woman in whose body it resides. She's the boss. Her life and what is right for her circumstances and her health should automatically trump the rights of the non-autonomous entity inside of her. Always. Always. See, essentially what she's saying is that because you as a fetus, because your story hasn't begun, your story doesn't matter. Mom's story is already going, so we have to make sure that this continues. But what we see in Jeremiah 1 is that it says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. God's saying that from the moment you were conceived, I already had a plan for you. Not only had your story already started, but your story was already important. Equally as important as the story that you're already inside of right now. She goes on to say, I have friends who have referred to their abortions in terms of scraping out a bunch of cells. And then a few years later were exuliant over the pregnancies that they unhesitatingly described in terms of the baby and this kid. I know women who have been relieved at their abortions and grieved over their miscarriages. Why can't we agree that how they felt about their pregnancies was vastly different, but that it's pretty silly to pretend that what was growing inside of them wasn't the same? Fetuses aren't selective like that. They don't qualify as human life only if they're intended to be born. This is true. They're all important. In Psalms 139, it says, For for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully 
and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Why is this important? One, it's important because God is intimately involved in forming each child in the womb, not just the ones that matter, all of them, not the ones that we say are worthy to be born, all of them. See, it also says that since God is the creator, each person is fearfully and wonderfully made, not mistakenly made. The reason we are fearfully and wonderfully made is because we have been made in God's image, and therefore we have intrinsic worth. And lastly, God sees our unformed substance. This speaks to our personhood even in the stages of development before identifiable body parts are formed. It doesn't matter when a baby starts to feel pain or when a heartbeat starts or when organs start to kick in or when they start kicking. They're important the whole time. This is how she begins to end her article. The majority of women who have abortions, and one in three American women will, are already mothers. And I can say, anecdotally, that I'm a mom who loved the lives she incubated from the moment she peed on those sticks and is now well over 40 and in an experimental drug trial. If by some random fluke I learned today I was pregnant, you'd bet you I'd have an abortion. I'd have the world's greatest abortion. And I would put the life of a mother over the life of a fetus every single time. Even if I still need to acknowledge my conviction that the fetus is indeed a life, a life worth sacrificing. The end. That's the other side. There's two sides. Not life and choice, those aren't the two sides. It's Christ in the world. Those are the two sides. So there's no way that we get to say, uh, I'm, I'm this for this, but then I'm, I'm God on this. You're either God for everything or, or, or not. We're not picking and choosing. See, the world's not picking and choosing. What they have us believing is that they're selling us this lie that it's just a clump of sales, but they don't even believe it. And they're telling you right now that they don't believe it. She knows it's a life. She also doesn't care that it's a life. What we're looking at is doing something that's convenient. This is a thing of convenience. It's not convenient for me. I'm telling you, it's never convenient to have kids. It's just never convenient. But what I want us to understand is that when we as the church start to have the same messaging as the world, something's gone wrong. How did we get to the point where we're no longer fighting for the innocent? How did we get to this point now where what they're saying is what we're saying, and we know that the world has never had the same messaging as us unless they're trying to use it to manipulate people? It goes even deeper than this because abortion isn't just a a flesh and blood thing. It's a spiritual battle. You see that women are going through depression, anxiety. They're going to therapy after, after abortions, night terrors. These are all things that they're experiencing, and if you think that that these are just normal, everyday things. They're not. These are things that we would help people get free from in freedom in Christ. This is a spiritual thing. And I'm going to show you guys why. We're going to take it all the way back, 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 back to where this whole thing started. Where did everything start? It started in the garden, and so did this abortion started in the garden. Hear me out. When we get to Genesis chapter 3, and everybody has gotten in trouble. The fruit's been eaten, and Adam's pointing at Eve, and Eve's pointing at the serpent, and now they're doing the Spider-Man point me. And God's like, I'll handle this. And he's talking to the serpent, and he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. It was at that point that Satan said, I've got a problem. I've messed up. And it was at that point then that he decided, I don't know what's coming for me or when it's coming for me, but it's me against you. 
And what do we see? We see Cain and Abel, and Abel was more than able to do what the Lord required of him. And then we see the first murder take place. Because behind the scenes, the enemy's going, I don't know, it could be this guy. I mean, he's doing everything God's telling him to do, but we got to take him out. Then what happens? We see God calls Abraham. And so now I know where it's coming from, but this guy's having problems having kids, and so I may not have to worry about him. Oh, hold on. His wife just had a kid. I better keep an eye on him. Oh, God's going to tell him to kill his kid. Cool. Oh, he didn't really. Okay, he didn't. Okay, now this guy has two kids. He's got twins. All right, now it's Jacob. I know it's one. He's got 12 boys. And so now we're just watching the growing. So now he's going, this is getting confusing. We just got to start killing people. I know which people it is now. It's the Hebrew people. I can handle this. And then we get to Exodus, and what do we see happening? Well, Pharaoh's killing the babies. Got to get rid of them. And what's happened now is that this is now ingrained itself into religion because the enemy knows how we feel about religion. We love it. We cling to it. And so if I can get something this nasty inside of religion, I'm in a good place. See, what happens is now we get to Leviticus. And what's happening in Leviticus chapters 18, 19, and 20 is that God is saying uh, to the Hebrew people, you guys have picked up some bad habits while you guys were in captivity. Kind of like the church has picked up some bad habits kind of mingling with the world on some things. And he's saying, we got to get some things clear because I don't do child sacrifices. That's not the kind of God that I am. I don't, I'm not asking you guys to sacrifice your kids. And then we look at Psalms 106, and it says, They sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons. They poured out innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. I'll tell you guys how it happened. The Canaanites had a god named Molech. And Molech had the, the head of a bull, and he was a large metal statue, and oftentimes they would keep the belly hollow, and so what they would do is they would fill the belly with flammables, you know, wood and whatnot, and it start to, you know, catch fire, and the idol would begin to heat up. And he had outstretched hands like this, and they would begin to glow red. And these parents would come up with their children And for some reason, sometimes these parents would come up with their kids because they needed to sacrifice so that maybe their agriculture would be better. Maybe there was a drought and they needed rain. Sometimes they would even sacrifice their kids so that the future kids would be prosperous. And so these glowing hands, outstretched, they'd walk over and take their infant and place them on these hands. And as the child began to scream, the priest would begin to bang on the drums to drown out the screaming. That's, oh, no, that's the same thing that we do now. When these young couples or single women, they go to Planned Parenthood. And if we sacrifice this kid, the next ones are going to be better because we're going to have finished college and we'll have careers and we'll be in a better place. And so they go in and they have an abortion. And the people outside are yelling so loud that it drowns out the screams of the children that are being aborted. Sometimes it may be an adulterous relationship or maybe a baby out of wedlock. And just the amount of shame that was felt, they would come and offer their children as well onto the outstretched hands. And we see it still today, where sometimes something happens, and the shame and the guilt catches up to you, and you find yourself at a Planned Parenthood, sacrificing your child. Now, while all this is happening, the enemy's behind the scenes rubbing his hands together because he said, it's war between me and you. It's always been war between me and you. And now you guys are killing yourselves, and now I can go focus on bigger things like, who's going to kill me? And so we just make our way 
to Matthew. And what happens in Matthew? It's that chapter that we all skip because it's just a long list of names. It's an important list of names because it's showing you where he's coming. So what happens when the announcement of the baby comes? Herod gets involved. And Herod's like, hey, I love kids. Bring them to me. I love to worship them too. Also, let's kill all the kids. And it's still happening. See, we look at abortion and we go, this is just something that we came up with because we had, we had nothing to do. But what I'm telling you is that from the beginning of time, abortion's been happening because it was never about us. It was always about him looking out for himself. And we were just kind of dumb enough to go along with it, unfortunately. What we need to understand is that this part of life before birth is so important because Jesus went through it. That makes it significant. See, if he just would have showed up as an infant just right on the scene, then we could have said, Everything that happens before that doesn't matter. If you would have showed up as a 12-year-old, we could have just said everything that happens before that doesn't matter. But instead, he said, it all matters, and I'm going to show you that it matters because I'm going to go through it. I mean, it tells us in Luke that Mary would conceive in her womb and bear a son, that she would conceive. Jesus was then conceived, which means that this is now a valid part of human life. He went through everything that we went through. He went through conception, so did we. He went through the birth canal, so did we. And all the way to death, it's still valid because he went through it. And he suffered, which also validates when we suffer. He went through it. We need to understand that. And when we decide that this part of life doesn't matter and that this part's not valid so we can just cut it out, then what we're also doing is telling people who came from bad situations that their life doesn't count. If you're a product of rape or incest, your life isn't as important as those of us who were born into happily wed parents. Everything that Christ went through is valid, and so therefore it's valid for us to go through as well. Now, how do we now respond as the church to this? Well, first, we have to look at ourselves. So I got some stuff for us to look at, too. Seven in ten women who have had an abortion identify as Christian. Now, they also roll Catholics and all that stuff up into there as well, and so that is in there. But 16% of these women who've had an abortion identify as evangelical Christian. 36% were attending church regularly at the time of their first abortion. Of the regular churchgoers, 52% still have not told anyone at their church about their abortion. What does it say about us, guys? Now, 38% believe the church is a safe place to discuss pregnancy options. Only 38%. 51% don't believe churches have a ministry to discuss options during an unplanned pregnancy. 65% say church members judge single women who are pregnant. And only 43% say it's safe to talk to a pastor about abortion. See, it it was cool when we first started, and I was showing you guys the stats for the world. And that's easy to look at, but now it's time for us to look at ourselves. And this is how they feel that we're judging them, that we don't even have programs in place to help them that we don't really care for them the way that we say we do, and that only 43% of them feel like they can talk to us as pastors about it. And that sucks. What are we doing? Our platform is is love, and that's what we at least say. But for many of us, we say that we're pro-life. However, here's what mom hears. Mom hears that you're pro-baby. You're not pro-me. You, you, you're not thinking about my life. And, and here's how we know that that's true, because as we're standing out in front of the Planned Parenthood with the sign saying, you're going to hell, you're a murderer, what happens when that woman decides, I'm going to keep my child? We put the sign down. We load it up in the car. 
We drive away. Our job here is done. Mission accomplished. Now we have a single mother who's being judged. Where did we help? We didn't. See, so here's how we can begin to to move forward. This whole series is about how do we think biblically, but it's not enough to just think it. We then have to act biblically. So here's how we act biblically, and it starts with we have to lead with love. What does that look like? What that looks like for me, what that looks like for us, what it should look like is, is when Jesus said, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Now, it's easy for us to look at that and say, oh, that's just the disciples loving one another. Well, at what point in time does a church love in itself ever entice anybody else to come in? Unless we begin to go out and love other people the way that we've been loved because we weren't always part of the church. See, now, if you meet somebody at a Planned Parenthood, and I don't care which decision she makes, but let's say that she makes the decision to abort that baby. She does not become dead to us at that point. We should embrace her still at that point because she needs us more than ever. And what should happen is that we should rally around her and help her see who she is so that if this situation ever occurred again where she was pregnant, Planned Parenthood would never be an option. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, hey, look, I don't have much, but you're not going to have to go through this by yourself. I've got three kids. What's one more? We can adopt that baby. We can help you raise that baby. We can help pay for child care, help you go to school, help you pay for groceries, whatever the case may be. Babies aren't cheap. But where do we jump in at? Where do we start then to care? See, when we look at Jesus and the woman who was caught in adultery, the first thing that happens when they throw her down to his feet is he kneels down to her level and he meets her where she is. We have to meet people where they are, and sometimes where they are is at the Planned Parenthood after a devastating decision has been made. And we, we kneel down and we meet them where they are. The great thing about the story is that he doesn't leave her there, which brings into point number two. How to act biblically is that we would teach hope and forgiveness. The numbers are crazy. They're staggering about how many women feel like this is the unforgivable sin, that there's not enough preaching about forgiveness for when they make this mistake. That they come to church and they feel like, God can forgive me for everything that I've done except this. And I know that to be true because now they're looking at us and everybody's judging me because of this. And what Jesus does is he does these things. He says that the first thing he does is that he sent her away without approving or accepting her sin. He didn't tell her it was okay. He didn't say, they're there. But what he did do is he recognized her sin because he told her to stop. Go and sin no more is what he told her. So he did acknowledge that she had sinned. Then he told her to repent and not to continue to sin. And then he gave her hope that she can live a life free from this. And that's what we're supposed to do. Meet people where they are, but don't leave them there. And definitely don't beat them up while they're there. One thing I like to do in in my spare time is I love reading books, listening to stories about people who have died. And if I just stopped there, that would sound weird. But people who died and gone to heaven and had the chance to come back. And one, one common theme that I see is that there are babies in heaven. And for those that have miscarried or have made the, the, the choice of, of abortion, One thing that we get when we get to heaven is not only do we get to spend eternity with our loving Father and Savior, but we also get to hold our children. And if that doesn't give you hope, I don't know what will. There is more to this. You don't have to live in this place of despair. There's hope. We're called to live a righteous life, though. So there are some things that we're going to have to admit to. We're not going to sugarcoat it for them, but we're not going to not love them. Number three, and this is important, never stray from the word. So focus on his word. 
And I'll tell you why this is important, because when it comes to abortion, the one thing that we see is people love to tell stories. The pro-choice side has a story, and the life side has a story, and everybody starts combating with stories. Well, this happened to my sister. Well, this happened to my brother. Well, this happened to my cousin. Well, this happened to my mother. And what happens is that the more stories that we tell, the further we get from the word. And that's exactly what the enemy wants. When we go to the word, what we see is that in Genesis, we see that man was created in God's image. But also in Genesis 4, we see the first killing of the innocent. In Exodus 20, we get the commandments, one of them being, thou shalt not kill. In Jeremiah 7, we see the rebuke of the child sacrifice. In 2 Kings 24, we see that the exile that occurred was because innocent blood had been shed. In Proverbs 6, we see that the Lord hates six things, and one of those things is hands that shed innocent blood. In Jeremiah 1, we see that the Lord calls us from the womb. In Isaiah, we double down and say that the Lord calls us from the womb. Psalms 139 says that he knit us together in the womb. There's something happening there. John 1 says that all things, all life comes through Christ. And in James 1.22 It says that religion requires us to help the helpless. That's taking care of the orphans and the widows. See, when you stay in the Word, you don't have to worry about telling compelling stories. There's a time and a place for compelling stories. If I'm honest, I would say that we got off track when we took sex outside of marriage. Things started getting kind of fuzzy. And fellas, what we have to understand is that I know that we're being asked not to be a part of the conversation. You're not a hero for not speaking up. See, we are called to protect, not control. Let me be clear. We're not called to control. We're called to protect. From the very beginning, we've been called to protect. And now what's happening is that because we haven't been protecting, now the ladies are saying, don't even join in. We got this. And the enemy says, perfect. I got you right where I want you. This is where I had you in the garden, and I've got you here again. So now I'm going to deceive you again. And we think that we're being chivalrous by saying, do your thing, ladies. You got this. There's nothing chivalrous about it. Fellas, we have to step up and protect Show that we care. When we look at 14% of married women, fellas, what are we doing? When we look at 25% of abortions coming from women who are living with a man but not married to him, there are some problems. The music team can come on up. I think it's important for us as believers to know that we're not picking sides in this. It's not a pro-life, pro-choice. And I mean, it may sound corny, but to me, it's it's pro-Christ. Because when we're pro-Christ, we're going to do everything that he's called us to do, not the things that are just comfortable and that we like doing. See, our feelings are fleeting. We read that, that what happens is that if you have a child, then all of a sudden your feelings change, and now it's it's a baby. But when it's not, it's just a clump of cells, and it all depends on what stage of life you're in. God's truth doesn't change depending on what stage of life you're in. It stays the same. Respectfully, we don't care about your feelings. We care about his truth. We live in a time now that says, you live your truth. You do what you feel is best for you. Yeah, that's the best lie that we've been told since the beginning that we get to choose what's right and what's wrong. But that's not the way it works. We as believers have to set the tone. We can't go the way that the world is going. It's time for us to change. See, I know what it feels like, I'm a young parent, and to have somebody come and offer you the quote unquote freedom that comes from an abortion. If you just make this decision, you guys can have more kids later on down the line is what you're told. 
But a lot of women don't recover from this trauma. And that's what it is. It's trauma. I told you guys that there are women who are going through so much. They're in therapy at a high rate after abortions. Depression, anxiety that kicks in. The nightmares. The one story I was reading, the lady said she couldn't stop hearing the screams of babies. That's difficult. Some, some, some young ladies get pregnant, but they don't want to let their families down, and so therefore they make the decision, and they have to live with this hidden shame so that their families never find out what happened to them. So today, if you or somebody that you know has been through this situation, I want you to know personally that this church is a safe space, that you can come and speak to us, and we're here to help. Me and my wife are safe people for you guys to talk to. We're young parents. We've been through this before. We understand the pressure that comes with somebody wanting you to do something that you know is not right. But my call to action for the church is it's time for us to step up. And let's stop beating these women when they're already down on the ground. I read a stat that said that if one family in every three churches in America adopted a child, that there would be no more kids left in the system one family in every three churches adopting one child. See, what we're doing is we're not giving these women the resources that they need, so they're looking at abortion as the best option for them. It's time for us as the church to be the church and to take care of those that are in need. I'm going to ask you guys to stand for prayer. The intercessors are up here with the glow sticks if you'd like to come up for prayer. But Lord, we want to give you all the glory, God, all the honor. Thank you for being such an amazing father. Lord, you are an excellent example of what a loving father is. Father, I just ask that for those that are struggling with the guilt, the shame, the condemnation that comes from from abortion. Lord, that you would see these hearts that are breaking and that you would lead them to a place where they can get free. Father, we know that your heart breaks every time a child is aborted, Lord. That is not your will. Lord, I ask right now that you would teach us as your church, as your body, Lord, how to step up and truly be a light during these dark times. That we would no longer feel like we have to fight with stats and words, Lord, but that our actions would show how much we care, not only for the child, but for mom as well. Guys, you're so good. Teach us to love. If we could just learn to love, the rest would come so easy. Teach us to love, Lord, the way that you love, not the way that the world loves, God. Father, protect those that are struggling right now. But remind them that there's hope and that they are loved and that forgiveness is an option for them. God, we give you the praise, the glory. We ask these things in your name.